What up, y'all? All right, Matt Johnson just sent me this track that I'm going to play over, so I figured I would video myself hearing it for the first time uh, just to get some reactions, and I'll kind of tell you what I think about it and what I might do. Mm. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Hell yeah. I got some some i mean it's funky it's got some changes um there's a bunch of stuff we can do to it now i just got to figure out which uh which path i'm going to take <laughs> all right y'all welcome to the yamaha behind the synth podcast i am uh i'm your guest host <laughs> for today and for a few of these my name is nick semrod and with me i have the legend Mr. Matt Johnson of Jamiroquai fame and fortune. How are you, Matt? Hey, Nick. I'm very good. Thanks, mate. Thank yeah, you man. We are. Here. Say it again. Sorry. I, I just said thanks for having me on here. Dude, of course. Yeah, yeah man. This is going to be really cool. Um, you and I got to, we've met before. Um, I feel like we played maybe a few shows together now, but I think the most memorable one for me was the, uh, uh, was it Georgia. Black Sea in Batumi? Yeah. Oh, it was great, wasn't it? Uh, we we had such a great time watching you guys play. <laughs> I remember Man. we weren't working that night, and we were just drinking and dancing all night, and it was fantastic. It's I do remember there. It, first of all, it was amazing for me because I've been I've been a huge Jamiroquai fan. I think basically since you joined the band, because you joined in O two, right? Like yeah, I did. I did. Okay, yeah. so that would have been. Not to not to date me or you too much, but that would that would have been like my junior senior year of high school, and I remember at the time, <clears throat> uh, I feel like you know I got into the whole virtual insanity thing, like everybody in the states did, yeah. And then I I kind of you know I've always been the against the grain, like let me see what else there is, and I I I got deep into just the er the really early stuff and you know, then deeper underground blew up. So I, I've been a super fan for a while. And I think just being able to like, not only see y'all in person, but <clears throat> see you in a situation where I can walk back, you know, I can watch backstage and kind of like, be a part of the hang and see how y'all prep. It was really, really magical and really fun. And you guys slaughtered it. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. I mean, uh, yeah, like I say, it was such, such fun. Fantastic. It's a very special, special place. So, um, yeah, I figured we'd start, you know, there's there's definitely some things that I feel like um, they're kind of the more cliche questions nowadays, but I do think people would be curious, especially because you're you're a part of such a big band and, and you know, you've done really well for your career. And tell me if I'm wrong, but I, f I feel like a lot of your career, you know, you've done some production things, some recording, you put out your own record last year, but you were touring quite a bit, right? Is, is that where most of the the kind of the income and the the music stuff well is yeah absolutely yeah absolutely i mean I, i've been very lucky because i've co-written the songs since i've been in jamaica wow right? okay awesome. so i've i've sort of co-written three albums with jay and and i've had a few other songs that have done well as well in europe hmm. so i've i've been lucky in that i have got royalties coming in but obviously yeah, like... you know touring is has always been the thing it's always been the thing for me which you will know and any yeah. gigging musician knows like you go on a tour and it's fantastic and then the tour finishes and you come home and you go what now then you know <laughs> no one calls you because everyone thinks you're on tour you're busy yeah. you know it's mm. suddenly you're down to zero mm. um so that's always been the situation and i've been lucky like i said that i've had royalties to buffet it sure but the funny thing is this year it's the the, the weird plus side for me has been doing this YouTube stuff that I, mm -hmm. that I, you know, my kind of wife pushed me to start doing it. I was like, Oh, I don't know about that, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if I was the right sort of person to do it, but sure. you know, it started growing and it's funny how work has come in through that. And, mm. you know, and I've been able to set up my own little shop and just make money. So it's actually been a cool thing that I now feel like if there's no touring, I have got a, a B plan yeah Which, you know as we all know as musicians it's really great to have a b plan always <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very much so i mean yeah that's an interesting thing um you know i feel it definitely comes from kind of the more the more um 
maybe people who are further along in their career who have had a chance to kind of build up their career, you know, like, uh, cause I, I had a very similar experience of you where, where it's like no more touring and you're kind of just forced to go like, all right, well, what the hell do I do now? You know, yeah. like there has to be some way. And I think a lot, you know, a lot of people went the teaching route, which I don't know if you mm. do at all, but I've done quite a bit of, I, um, I, I, I've never really done it. No. Okay. Um, but it's, you know, it's such an adaptation that, that if, people hadn't done it before it's kind of weird to jump into right away yeah you know, like it's, it's, it's a skill it's, in itself isn't it it's very it's a much thing. a skill set yeah. yeah um and so you know the whole like kind of building an online thing and building an online store i think was was the path that a lot of people in your and i boat your and i's boat yeah. took um so so yes. what have you been selling have you been selling like merch and sound sets and stuff like what's kind of your yeah uh, not, not merch but just just little things like i you know i, I did things like get a nice sound on my mini mode model d you know mm -hmm. put it through space echo and sell it you know for nice. quite a low price but a lot sure. of people buy it mm -hmm. and it's fun you know people are enjoying it they're getting something out of it mm. and what i found was a good way to do was to i just tie it in with the video so if mm -hmm. i'm doing a video i might feature the sound and then mm -hmm. it's a connection you know sure uh you know i'm not taking it too seriously but it's just an, a nice extra thing i've just done a sound set for the uh, sequential profit six as well oh nice okay yeah which which people are really enjoying so and that we'll was have, fun to make you know, we'll have was... to trade we'll have to trade those <laughs> yeah yeah let's I, just I, i'll I, send I, it to you yeah, yeah no problem <laughs> you know definitely uh, yeah. yeah yeah have you done one of you for the six yeah i've, I've done quite yeah. a few for them i did one for um the cp that i think yamaha has out uh sorry not the cp what's this i have it here the yc61 um, oh yeah 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 so i did one for that um and yeah lots of sample packs and things like that um and it's been interesting that that i i feel like and i was going to ask you about this like in building the online channel and kind of going that route i i feel like something that i noticed about the way you did it that i really respect and and like is that um you know a lot of people when they go that career they they change themselves to do it you know, it, it ends up being some mm. sort of like feels insincere. Yeah, and it ends up being kind of more about appeasing the people who they're trying to sell to. And yeah. and the first thing I noticed when I was kind of researching your channel was like you're you're literally just being you. <laughs> it was like yeah. you're playing the things that yeah. you kind of play anyway. You're doing the you know the yeah. kinds of music that you kind of do anyway. And yeah. so it's kind of a like you know take it or leave it, which I I love you know because it's oh, not. Yeah, it's not this big, like, I'm going to try and impress everyone out there. Like, was that something you thought about or did it just kind of come naturally for you? I think it did come naturally. I think I've got a bit of a radar, probably like you, that I can't be, you know, I can't use this the word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I have to be comfortable with myself. And sure. I, I don't want to look at it and feel, oh, my God, this is... I'm making myself cringe, you know, so, uh, you know, I just want to go on and like you say, be, be, be myself, not sure. trying to act like I'm God, you know what I mean? There's yeah. millions of keyboard players that can play better than me. It's not about that anyway, as we know, you know, sure. it's, it's just about, uh, I always just feel like with music, it doesn't matter whether you're doing media or whatever you're doing, you know, everyone's got something to offer. And the best thing you can do is, like you said, just be sincere about yourself. Sure. People will either like you or they won't, I suppose, you know. Um, yeah. But at least you don't feel like you're kind of prostituting yourself, you know. Sure. <laughs> Did you ever have those moments? Because I, I feel like no matter how confident I personally get in who I am musically, there's there's still the moments where I'll, I'll put something out, you know, whether it's a tutorial or video or whatever, and it won't quite get the the thing that I want. It won't get the energy I want. Do you ever do you ever have those moments where you're like, did I did I go the right route there? All the time, every time, every time I release a video, I really care what people think, you know. And uh, and and you know what it's like for most of us, we're insecure about our playing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, we try our best, and we just hope people will dig it. And I, I'm I'm almost always pleasantly surprised. Because mm -hmm. I can see all the flaws and everything, um, mm. but I guess other people look through it with different eyes, don't they? You know, yeah. um, to to how we see it ourselves. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not someone that always thinks, "Oh, yeah, this is fantastic." You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Well, and, and I think too because of your experience as a producer and as a mm. writer, 
you know, you're, you're probably even more inclined to like hear something and look at it from all these different angles. True. Um, yeah. and you know, I mean, it's, it's cliche to say at this, at this point, but you know, we really are our own kind of worst critics in those situations, but it, but it makes it really tough. Um, you know, especially when you're trying to bridge that kind of gap between like, okay, I'm, I am marketing, you know, like I'm doing yeah, this yeah. for people, for money. I know it seems yeah. bad to say, but like, no, you know, yeah, sure, yeah. you're doing it for a living, but you also, yeah. it, there, there can come a point where, where I think some people will dive so into that, that they just lose everything themselves. unique about them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I totally agree. And I've, I've sometimes felt like that, like I'm really loving doing it, but I don't want this to be me who I am. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's really useful to me and I really enjoy, I do enjoy sharing knowledge and I think it's all musicians should be generous with whatever the experience they sure. had because, you know, like when I was, just starting out there wasn't that resource you know there just mm. wasn't the resource where you could uh it doesn't matter about music or just learning about anything youtube mm -hmm. is such an incredible resource yeah. on the internet <laughs> generally isn't it you know it's, yeah. it's it's fabulous um but i i don't want to get pigeonholed into doing that so sometimes i'll back away from it for a little while i think you know i'm not going to do a video for a couple of weeks i'm just gonna make some music actually sure making music is what I do, not, not just showing people how to make music, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a weird thing. I, I, I feel like a lot of musicians, I don't know, struggle is the right word, but like they struggle with that where, where getting into these boats of like, let me do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Um, I think from an outside perspective, um, and I've kind of seen this in my, my non-musician friends, you know, they'll, they'll look at something like what COVID has done to the industry and they'll see someone like, like you or I, who, you know, like now almost all of our income is coming from online or from lessons yeah. or sales or whatever. Um, yeah. And they're like, oh, why, you know, you, you complain about touring so much or traveling is hard and, you know, you, you can do all this and wake up in your pajamas and mm -hmm. like sleep 10 hours if you want. And it's like, why wouldn't you always do that? And, and I do think there's, it's just a weird form of expression to always do um mm, definitely you know, yeah and well, you're not uh, getting the feedback are you, you yeah. you're not getting the direct feedback from people well, it's, but, it's a, yeah. it, you're getting feedback it's just a very different you know like the live show yeah. thing is so raw and so you know like you could have someone who who had the the worst day on the planet and you know yeah. the, just the yeah. energy like even if they don't dig the band they're hearing the energy of yeah. the band they're hearing can kind of go like oh all right let me dance to this totally and, I don't know that a laptop or a phone is doing that. You can never replace that. And and it's, um, I don't know if you find this, but what I find is my game goes up quite a few degrees when there's a big crowd in front of me. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. and I, I find you, I miss that. I miss that sort of adrenaline of like, right. It's not like I have to do this. You know, if, mm. if you're recording, whatever you're doing at home, you've got, you can just a million opportunities to redo it and you can be a perfectionist. Yeah. You know, but on stage, obviously, you've got to, you've got to step up to the plate, and I I think that's what we probably all miss a little bit. You know, that just being in the moment and going for it, and yeah, what well, yeah, and and it's it's I feel like there's a couple reasons for that. I mean, one one just the energy transfer of like I'm portraying an emotion, getting it out there, and people are responding to that. You know, that's that's a very it's a very therapeutic thing. I think there's even been papers done Absolutely. on how how artists like that's the way that they have therapy sometimes it's yeah like, no it's I like, totally let me let me that. talk talk yeah. all my problems yeah, yeah. out you know <laughs> yeah um, true. and well, so there's yeah. there's there's that thing but then there's also um and i this could be a cultural thing tell me i'm, I'm sure this is a thing in england as well but um mm. i know that when i'm playing live my like my my battle attitude comes out a little bit totally where, where I, it's like, I almost know, I'm like, okay, there's some other musicians in the crowd. Like, let yeah. me, let me come out. Yeah, 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 yeah. You want to you know? come with your game, with your best game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, so, you know, that in front of, again, in front of a computer screen, totally different thing. Like, mm. I, it's, it's really hard to summon. I don't know if you've dealt with that at all, but like bringing that same energy is, is very, very different for me. Have you, have you? It, me too. 
absolutely 100 percent. i feel it you know i really do like i say even my, my wife always says when i sit i sit and practice on the piano you know you're gonna hear bum notes everywhere and she'll be like you, you're gonna be all right you're gonna, sure you're gonna be all right i'm on the gig i'm, I'm normally you know i i nail it yeah it's just because i have to and it just brings me up a gear so i really miss yeah. that i've got to say and like you say the sort of shamanistic kind of ritual of it all where you give out loads of energy and then the crowd give it back to you and it goes and it just sort of rises and rises and becomes this euph euphoric feeling, you know, for it's, everyone. Yeah, I mean, to, and to a certain extent, it, it, it almost has a has a a churchy kind of feel to it. You know, yeah. like even, even if someone isn't religious or isn't spiritual, there's something about being on stage with a group of people or even being in the audience which with thousands of people listening to people on stage yeah you know you you really start kind of feeling this unification mm -hmm. you know like I've, I've definitely played in bands with people who i believe very different things than and mm -hmm. on stage that it's part of my language but that never matters to me that's <laughs> like, right well it transcends everything doesn't yeah. it? it transcends race and everything you know exactly. that's what i love about music it brings people yeah. together you know and yeah you know in a weird way it's 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 really hard to explain too because it just it's like you start and then you're there like yeah it's really hard to not have that happen yeah 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 it's true it's true yeah um yeah i, I really i mean for for just world health world mental health sake i hope that shows uh shows come back soon do you have anything on the books have you guys started planning things for next year at all no i mean you we we're, we're sort of we were kind of at the end of a cycle anyway mm, okay you know, like you know we, we we've been touring the last album for a good couple of years sure so we should have been making an album but we haven't started doing that yet but i'm sure. hoping that this year we'll we will start doing that now now everyone's kind of getting their jabs you know and it'll mm -hmm. be safe to hang out again yeah hopefully hopefully we'll we'll make this because i reckon this year is still a good year to make a record i mean it's going to be amazing when for the gigs that do start whoever does mm -hmm. the first big gig God, yeah 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 then, but i think maybe it might be oversubscribed and then maybe next year or something it might get a little bit back to some sort of normality i'm hoping you know? yeah i definitely hope that too it's I, I've been talking with some friends about how I, I at some point I think there's going to be a really big bottleneck that's going to be a, it'll be an interesting shift in the music scene a little bit because I think everyone is going to try and tour at one time. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's not going to be it's not going to be doable for everyone. No, I mean, yeah. the, the money doesn't exist for it right now. The festivals yeah. don't exist. I mean, even when they come back, it's I feel like you're going to see a very limited version of it. To start with, at least, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Absolutely. It'd be really I mean, right now, I just even enjoy going and playing in, in a pub somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> just to go and just to go and play, really. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah, I definitely. I got an email from a local uh, Los Angeles promoter today, and he was like, "We're booking things for June," and I like just started sprinting around the apartment. Sign me up, yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I don't even care. Like solo piano, whatever you want. Yeah. Dress in a hazmat suit, whatever you need me to do. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. I might just wear a hazmat suit anyway, just because. Yeah. Um. So t tell me this. I, I'm always curious about, um, especially like the YouTube platform stuff, because um, I've 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 put most of my time kind of in the the IG camp, the Instagram camp, just because it kind of works for me the best. Um, but, you know, I noticed like your IG, like you have a pretty good IG hang. It's like 18, 19,000, something like that. But then your YouTube scene is like 70,000 or something. Like I, I, I have to ask, like, how did you go about building that? Like, were there specific strategies that you were kind of, you know, using to kind of get more looks at it, like, or was it just completely natural? It was kind of luck, I think, to a degree. To a degree. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I think what kicked it off was I did a, a video on them. I mean, uh, to start with, I thought I sort of saw a bit of a gap in the market in that mm -hmm. um, I'm like all of us. I'm a nerd. Do you know what I mean? I like sure. to check out. I want to see what the new gear is. Sure. And, and I, uh, what started me off with it really was uh, with the Moog One. Mm, okay. I was so interested in it, and when I looked online, I just could not find anyone doing anything other than going like zoing, <laughs> wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It's like, look, I just can't get an idea or a sense of what this thing can do. Mm. Uh, and so then it made me realize, well, if I feel like that, then other people must feel like that as well. Mm. So then I started just, okay, well, I'm going to do a demo that you can actually hear the sounds, sounds that are usable rather than, you know what I mean? Those sounds yeah. where you just one know and it's a galaxy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so, and, and people just responded really well to that. And mm, then amazing. what happens with YouTube is it's basically their algorithm, their mm -hmm. AI just picks up when there's interest in it. And then they throw you in the, you know, the front of the queue, basically when you do a <laughs> next video. Yeah. So I kind of rode the wave of that and sure. and bit by bit I started to realize what people like and what they don't like. So I've just tried to navigate that with what I'm comfortable doing. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and so I've got a little bit better. I'd say I'm still pretty amateurish, but I, I've got better at putting a program together because obviously that is a different skill from playing the keyboards or, you know, doing yeah. whatever. Yeah, are, and and did you have to dive into like learning the video editing and all that stuff? I mean, the audio editing's you know probably easy on your end by yeah. now. But like, there's definitely I've noticed with like the the title screens and all that stuff. It's that's another skill set that's like really important to that thing. Right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I've I've got Final Cut Pro. I use that. Okay. It's pretty easy to use. You know, I, I I'm not going to say I'm amazing at it, but I can. Mm. I'm okay at it, you know, I can get it together and I'm get I'm learning bit by bit, you know, again about camera, lighting, it's all these things that come into it that you obviously don't think of. Um, it's it's rough for me. <laughs> like yeah, yeah it's, I I've, I definitely feel the uh uh I it, it's easy in in that hang to get very overwhelmed, I think. Um, yeah. you know, again, as an artist, you're, you're thinking about so many things artistically and then to yeah. throw on like, oh yeah, now instead of mixing or sound choice, now I have to pay attention to like, is the light hitting my glasses in a certain way? And like, oh yeah, exactly. I know I've, I've done whole videos and mm -hmm. I've been, oh, that was good. Cause what I do, I just go in, I just jam for a while, whatever. And sure. then later on, I'm like, oh, what was good. And mm -hmm. then you realize, oh, the camera's completely out of focus the whole time and I can't even see anything, <laughs> scrap it all. Yeah. very annoying but um uh, yeah yeah I, what i've realized and i wish i'd done it years ago in my career you know i've got some friends that did it earlier like I, there's a drummer i don't know if you know called ash Soam, mm. and he very early on in, in the in the game adopted the thing of doing good videos and mm. just putting them on instagram or facebook and you know everyone's like oh look at him you know he's so full of himself kind of thing but actually mm. He's just trying to get his business together mm -hmm. and and it's worked for him you know and he's a great drummer and people know about him because of the communications i i wish i'd embraced it a lot earlier that, yeah. that would definitely be advice to people who might shy away from it feeling like oh i don't want to seem like an idiot i don't want to seem like i'm loving myself too sure. much do you know what i mean yeah. um because it's just these days i think it's just a essential part of the just game. part of yeah i feel that i mean i feel like part of i i i shamefully admit that i may have been one of those people who would criticize that early on. Yeah, me but too. It, I, but I, I, yeah early on. yeah but i and i feel like the the main reason for it um and especially with someone like ash i don't get that i've seen a few of his videos and and your stuff and some you know some of my homies who are doing really well in that deployment um mm. department they the critique for me had been like, okay, the people who spend all their time thinking about that stuff aren't yeah. spending it thinking about the music. And again, yeah. I feel like, again, that there's that, that strange line between how do I keep this honest and, you know, put my energy into something that's kind of like artistically, mm relevant or interesting or or i mean maybe honest oh, just pushing yourself that. you mean as a as a personality and nothing else yeah yeah, yeah. because I, I especially out here in la there's i mean yeah. I, i'm going to criticize the scene a little bit but there's a lot of that thing where it's very you know my video looks amazing and i have this great camera <laughs> and this great angle and yeah. you know i wrote everything i was going to play but yeah. none of those people can actually perform on gigs. And so yeah. I, I think yeah. I have a bit of PTSD of like, oh, like, let me let me be careful here. Um, I totally hear you. And especially, I think it's changing a little bit now, but there used to be so many shredders in there that they're just getting on playing the chops. You know, it's, like, it's great. It's fantastic. But yeah. how often do you need that, you know, in, 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 in context of your career, yeah. unless you're, you know, 
doing yeah. a hardcore jazz gig or whatever. <laughs> sure. well, and, it's, and it's interesting now because like before, you know, the, the cynical part of me would say, there's no excuse for doing that. Like if you're trying to be a musician, because there's gigs, there's places to play, there's mm -hmm. other markets, but now it's like online is the market. It's literally, it's the place where people are finding gigs or are finding music. It's the place where people are, are interacting and hanging out. Mm -hmm. um, it's the place where they're seeing concerts. And so to a certain extent that that field is, is as important now as dressing up for the gig. Yeah. You know, or, yeah. or, or, or always on kind of thing. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's like before I could put my money into, I could buy this jacket and I'm going to look cool on stage. And now it's like, Oh, now I have to have a DSLR and all these lights. And, and so I look good on my post and it's like, I don't know, maybe the, the old man in me is like, oh, I don't know. I, I, I totally agree. <laughs> I mean, I, I sometimes, you know, I'm sure we all like, you look back on artists, like some of the great ones, you know, mm. like Aretha Franklin, for instance, mm. And you wonder, you know, would she get signed today? You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's it's crazy to think, but yeah, I. I but nice. I'm hoping that I I, I feel to do, to uh, on one sense, obviously there is all this Instagram and everything. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. The only good thing I feel like with music now is like because often you don't see the band, you hear them first. Mm. Which that turned around, you know, at one point in the eighties, obviously you saw the video first. Yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. all about the glamour. Whereas at least now it feels like you have a chance to organically find music. You know, much as I don't really love Spotify and stuff, I, all these search mm -hmm. engines that they have mm -hmm. are very cool for discovering things. That's that, a good point. Yeah, you know, and and you can find good music and have no idea what the people look like who were making it. And um, I like that. You know, I do like yeah. that because. You know, yeah. Um, it's de yeah, it's definitely way more accessible now. And, you know, there's there's costs and benefits to all these things, um, you know, but the, the plus is, is that now I don't think you need a ton of money to make something great. You know, mm. um, I remember, I don't, I don't know if you're a, are you a James Blake fan at all? Oh, yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I love That's James my, Blake. my, my dude. Um, and yeah, that first I remember album. when I've, oh, yeah. It's so out there. Yeah. I mean, in all his, all the pre, you know, when he wasn't really singing yet, all that kind of stuff to me is just mind blowing. And I, I just remember hearing stories about that where it was like, yeah, it was him, you know, like he used Profit 8 and his like cheap, terrible laptop in his room, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm thinking like, wait, hold on. You made that from like an $800 setup. Like what the hell? Hell is going on there you go. you know? it does, yeah you're right it's a big lesson there isn't it it's like we all always lust after that gear and believe that if only we had the fair child <laughs> our vocals yeah. would sound great but it's just not true you know it's like well, well and, and even into it. yeah and even even to bring in you know like to talk about some of the yamaha stuff it's like mm. those those refaces like you know you can be super affordable and <laughs> they're, all, they're all hanging out <laughs> I love that tripped me out so much for for whatever yeah. reason I thought there was like a fire behind you and then you turn well, around and pulled out a reface. Well, I just got like <laughs> I was like holy shit, he just right pulled out a reface out of the fire. It's like a Lord of the Rings <laughs> keyboard. Dude. That's so good. Um but yeah, you know, it's like you have boards like that and and you know, people can and make music from that in their room with like tape players and stuff and and yeah. the lo-fi scene makes that possible you know so yeah. so i i there is a plus to this huge amount of availability and, and the market kind of shifting to like making everyone able to do this which which is good um yeah. it changes a lot of things but it's good i think <laughs> yeah yeah I, no, I think people with great ideas will always get through you know hopefully yeah. i hope you know and We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Oh, it was interesting. I did a, a little masterclass for a uni up in Manchester mm -hmm. in North okay. of England. It was the first time I'd done one. And I was quite staggered by the, the standard of the players. They were mm. great. They were really good because I, I thought, do people have patience to learn instruments these days? Yeah. But actually, the level seemed really high to me. And I was, I was quite, you know, I was pleasantly surprised by that. Thank God. <laughs> yeah yeah it, i i sort of imagine people not having the patience to and and rather mm -hmm. i'd rather just kind of i don't know you see all these packs where you, you know you can make 
four wonderful chords without knowing anything about mm. chords you know and, mm. uh, it's fine but it does worry you a bit doesn't it that you know yeah everyone that is going to be very generic i guess yeah well and that's that's going to be the you know the battle now and maybe this is a, a cost of of ubiquity in music information is that um you're gonna have a lot less of like the scene or the sound that's specific to an area or specific mm -hmm. to a group group of people you know before it was like if you grew up in new york you sounded kind of like new york and so well, that actually, thing yeah. almost alone could get you work somewhere else you know mm -hmm. um and and something that i'm seeing from a lot of these colleges now is is you know no matter where they're at, whether it's a school in Holland or a school in New York or a school in Brazil or something, um, you know, there's there are some kind of region specific, maybe tunes or, or genres sometimes. But like there is a lot of focus on like one type of sound. Um, yeah. And because, you know, again, because it's present, there's people yeah. are killing at it. Um, yeah. But it's I feel like my advice more and more has been like, all right, what else? You know, what's the what's the thing you can do that that can't do? That's it. You got to have an angle, haven't you? That's oh, I totally agree with that. That's it. It's all about finding your niche and yeah. being it, like you're right. People get homogenized a bit with with all the the maybe you know some of the colleges, but um, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's it's about finding a reason why people want to hire you. It's as simple as that, isn't it? You know? Yeah, like, very much so. We've all got to find our own thing, you know? And, and that's what I do try to tell people. It's like, you know, pay as much attention as to sounds and parts and melodies as you, or more attention to that than learning all the licks and, and all sure. that, because there's just so many great players that can do all that stuff, you know? And it, mm -hmm. it, I'm not saying it's not, it's lovely to be able to do it, but I just think uh, spending time, like you say, trying to find your own little unique slant on how to play the keyboards is a great thing if you can. Sure, yeah. Well, and that that actually leads me into my next question. Um, in that, like, I'm always curious how people kind of got into the thing that they've been doing. Um, yeah. You know, and I I read that your when you started playing with Jameer Kwai, it was something where you, I think you got called by a previous band member to audition in a one right, or two yeah. or something like that. Um, tell me kind of how that went and like, what, what do you think got you the gig? I hope, I hope, hope hopefully it's not too broad of a question. <laughs> no. Uh, um, well, I mean, I basically, I, I, what happened was I auditioned for another gig mm. and the, the Stuart Zender, who was the ex, bass player mm -hmm. and the guitarist Simon Katz were in the band. Okay. So when the original keyboard player left, they recommended me to the drummer. Okay. He called me up. I, I turned up and I just, I, they sent me like four tracks to learn. So I really took a long time learning them. I made mm. sure I learned them properly and I programmed some sounds as well. Nice. Um, yeah. I programmed the sounds up and, and I, then I also learned some other songs, you know, mm -hmm. some of which was turned out to be a good move. Nice. Um, and when I got to the audition, uh, they were having a few days worth of auditions. Um, I think everyone else had used, they just had a Rhodes in there. Mm. And and I think there was a synth that was just, or a clav or something up there. And they wanted me to use that. And I said, look, I'll use the Rhodes, but I want to set up my keyboards. You know, they were quite reluctant for me to do that. By oh, wow. On it. Yeah. And, and, and that was, I think, a good move because straight away I was playing the tunes, the right parts that you're supposed to be hearing with a sound that sounds something like what you've got on the record. Sure, yeah. And I think, um, and then, because uh, Jay, when I first turned out, the singer Jay was like quite moody looking. It was like in the morning, <laughs> he looked a bit like he'd had a bit of a night the night before. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, oh, what's this going to be like? He, he yeah. did, it wasn't in the room, I started playing, the band started playing. And then he suddenly bounded into the room. He'd obviously been listening in the next room, you know, mm -hmm. and, it, and he obviously liked what he heard. And then he was he was all full of energy. And he said, yeah, play a solo, bust a solo, you know. And I just sort of went for it, you know, with the solo. Yeah. And then he was all buzzed up, you know. And I, I think what, obviously, he wanted to hear me be able to jam as well. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of jamming and I just went for it when it, when it was my time to jam. When sure. it wasn't my time to jam, I just played the parts as close as I could to the record. And uh, mm, okay. I have noticed a few times when we've auditioned other people or uh, 
seeing other people in that situation sometimes people turn up and they they they've just approximated the tunes they haven't got them down properly Ugh. and i just think if you get them down properly it's going to help you so you know you're just going to put you above the next person because yeah because you know that they're, they're not thinking about you so much they're thinking about their music and if you mm. start playing a load of like i don't know altered chords all over the thing you know it's like they're, well, what's going on there's you know the, uh, so I think I don't know. I think that helped me, and yeah. just uh, just going for it on the day, really. You know, there's such a lesson in that, and and it's <laughs> you can tell by my visceral reaction. I I still don't understand to this day the people that like will do a gig, especially an audition, like something for something big, mm. and just kind of know the stuff. Like that's yeah. always just been, it's like, if I ever write a book on how to get gigs, it's like, yeah. like, I, I mean, it's like, you know, going to a plumbing job, never having seen a toilet before. It's like, it's like, I mean, what do you think you're doing there? You know, like, yeah. that's the thing. Like, you have to know the thing. Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. I know? mean, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and, and it, there's so many other things that come with it, you know, like, if you know the music, then you you can also you can also kind of get into this boat where you can read the artist. You know, like this is something I've done a lot, and like Lauren Hill was really big about this. Where if you didn't knew if you didn't know the tunes, she knew. If you mm -hmm. couldn't improvise, she knew. And so you had to pay really close attention to kind of her vibe in the rehearsal when she chose to be there um or the <laughs> gigs themselves um and and you had you had to you had to know the tunes so that if the improvised thing wasn't the vibe you could come back to the tune and if it was then you're still improvising within the song it's still you know you're still there in a support role it's just you're you're speaking in support of a song um and I, so you had a sensitivity about the music yeah. the artist is making, so that you, yeah. You can well, it and it's it's in essence that's the whole thing is like you're, unless you're in a part of your career, and this this does happen. So I, I feel like I have to mention it. Unless you're in a part of your career where people know that you have a thing, you have like a very unique, you know, I think about mm -hmm. a bass player like Mono Neon, like no one is yeah. going to, I don't know if you know him. I know he played on my record. Oh, killing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's the best. Yeah. But he's like, if you hire Mono Neon, you know that you're getting that thing and you're hiring him for that. It's like, yeah. here, here's a thing. I'm hiring that, yeah. um, but, you know, but but 99 percent of the time, unless you have some super out there, totally unique personality, people are hiring you because they expect you to be able to do their thing better than someone else can. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And yeah. and it's just fascinating to me that people will go into these situations and be like, what's the song? It's like, oh. <laughs> not, giving you, not giving yourself a fighting chance, are no. you? you know? Yeah. And then, like you say, if you've really rehearsed it, you know, it in your sleep. Yeah. When it kicks in, you're you, you're in you know you're in control because even if you're a little bit edgy or whatever, you know the stuff. You've got it down. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. And and like you say, you're ready to respond when they might say, "Okay, do this now." You know, you, you you're in a position to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. I still do it with Jay. And that to this day, you know, if we're on stage. Because he has so much keyboards of my keyboards in his monitor. Sure. Because he likes to pitch to them, you know. Mm, so okay. I have to be really sensitive of what I play. Mm. And I have to sort of keep an eye on him to see what kind of night he's having. You know what I mean? Yeah. If he's having a great night, then I don't really need to worry. I can jam a bit. But if he's mm. if he sounds terrible and he's struggling a bit, mm -hmm. I, I try to be really sensitive to that and sort of help him along as best I can, you know. That's huge, man. I mean, that's a great strategy. And that that speaks a lot to why you're still there yeah, <laughs> and well, why you've been successful, you know? It comes down to things like that, doesn't it? I think, yeah. you know, you know, to think about the situation and how you can best be a team player in that situation. That's what people want, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's so, it's so crazy to me. <laughs> yeah. Advice. All right. Kids watching this, please <laughs> yeah. listen to my friend, Matt Johnson here. That's, I mean, it's really advice. Number one is yeah. just, just have, have a respect for the artist enough to 
come prepared, you know, and, and even if the artist is a church or a wedding band or whatever, it's like, yeah. there will never, if you, if you were to default one direction, if you always default knowing too much, Absolutely. like, yeah, you might sleep a little less and it might take some more work, but the, yeah. you will never get yelled at for anything on that gig. You'll never get not hired by someone again for that reason it's like there's so many positives that coming that come with that that it's, i don't know why you wouldn't do that it's the way to climb the ladder isn't it because if you're starting out and you like you stay you do a you might do a 50 dollar gig whatever you know mm -hmm. but there might be a couple of good musicians at that gig yeah you've learned all the stuff they'll yes. check you oh yeah they really they they were on it you know the other people are looking at you to know mm -hmm. what the chords are and you're the yeah. one that knows and then well, you're and get pulled back. it's as simple as that. Very much so. And I think, you know, weirdly enough, I think you can even take that mindset to to non gig related things. Like I'll, I'll give you an example where when I first moved to New York, there was a um, there was a jam session at this place called the five spot. It was called like Taste the Stage or something like this. And this oh. guy, uh, Nate Jones hosted. He was a bass player, really killing bass player. And yeah. You know, when I first went there, it was such an eye opener for me because I, I moved from the Midwest, from Nebraska, and there was I wasn't used to that level of musicianship, so mm. it killed me. I was just like, "Holy, what's happening?" But my yeah. my approach there was like, "All right, how am I? How do I get into this? Like, I don't know any of this music. You know, I don't know these chords and all this crazy." Shit. And mm. literally, my first move was, "All right, I'm gonna go to this thing for a month straight. I'm gonna write down every song I hear." And it mm. turns out, like any jam wow. session or any scene, there's always favorites. There's you always the favorites. The, <laughs> yes, that's a great way. All, you know, there's the like, okay, the way by Jill Scott was played. Right. Every, yeah. You know, it's that <laughs> tune. There's like, uh, like doo-wop, that thing was played every week. There was like the wow. ten Prince tunes that always got covered. Um, and so, just knowing those got me in, got me on stage. You know, they yeah. would call tunes and be like, hey, who knows this one? Hand up. Yeah. yeah brilliant that's uh, and, then, um, that's and then from there then yeah. again if you want to get into reharmville and all this kind of like you know mm. cool hip stuff you, mm. now you have a platform but without that platform without not only the platform of like earning your way on stage by having people trust you but also like knowing the platform of the song if you don't have that you know a reharm without knowing the song is just the wrong song like yeah. Yeah. you're not reharmonizing anything you're just Throwing everyone off. yeah yeah you're just playing some other like um, <laughs> um but yeah so so that i think both what you and i are saying is really good advice just like preparation is effing huge to this whole industry especially if you're trying to be a side guy and like do what we do and tour it's it's everything it's everything it's the whole thing yeah. and even if you're going to be an artist you know i'd like i I remember I worked with a young artist. She was great, uh, 18 years old, and mm -hmm. started writing together. And she got a big deal with, a, with like RCA. And I kept saying to her, you should get out. Just get out, do mm -hmm. gigs. Doesn't matter if it's a tiny pub with 10 people, get out and get used to doing it. And she's like, oh, my management don't want me to be exposed, you know. And, and she didn't do any gigs. And then like the first gigs she was doing was like Jules Holland and, mm -hmm. and Radio One, which is the big radio here. Yeah there's no way you're going to be able to nail that well when you've not done any gigs you know because the nerves are just uh, going to kill you you know yeah. so i think you know it's like it's just important to get out there and, and prepare for what you do learn, practice yeah. what you do yeah and you know there's so many things that you wouldn't even know to practice that happen at a gig you know yeah, what i mean true, i mean yeah. even even the thing of like okay how do i read the artist to know if they want a reharm or if they want me to just play this or if they're relying on me for yeah. their specific you know instrument um, yeah yeah it's like yeah. you don't you don't you will have no idea how to read those things until you failed at them a few times absolutely because there's no way to practice that like how do you practice that from your bedroom no yeah, it's just thousands of gigs oh you know. yeah literally thousands <laughs> yeah. oh my goodness um so i i I feel like this may be the first time Yamaha has done this thing, but they approached you and I with kind of an interesting uh, scenario that I'm going to think, I, I think is going to happen in the next few of these podcasts where 
the interviewee will send music to the interviewer and um and i don't know what you're sending me i get it i play over it you have no idea what i did um so this should be cool so i i'm gonna play for everyone i'm gonna do a little screen share here hopefully if my computer doesn't flip out um and i have a video basically the day that you sent me the track um i just have a, a kind of a bad phone video of me watching it and going and reacting so let me share the screen and then all right is that up there yep all right so ladies and gentlemen here is this is maybe five minutes after Matt emailed me the tune. And I, I'm listening to it and kind of reacting. So here's here's that video. What up, y'all? All right, Matt Johnson just sent me this track that I'm going to play over. So I figured I would video myself hearing it for the first time uh, just to get some reactions. And I'll kind of tell you what I think about it and what I might do. So, uh, yeah, here we go. Let me play it for y'all. Hopefully my volume is good. Yeah, it's there. good. That's gonna be fun. Hell yeah. We got some, some, I mean, it's funky. It's got some changes. Um, there's a bunch of stuff we can do to it. Now I just gotta figure out which, uh, which path I'm gonna take. <laughs> Hell yeah. Okay, so I, I'll, let me add to my initial reaction to that. So, first of all, the track is rad as hell. I was hyped to play over it. Um, you, and the, hey, let me stop sharing this for a second. Um, my, my the thing one of the things that i listen for in situations like this immediately is like all right what's there and what's not there you know like of the things i do what are involved and so the first part of the tune my ear is going like okay this is you know super funky and this to me you know it, it doesn't sound like a tower of power ish kind of tune but it has that kind of like 16th rhythmic thing where it's like there's a lot going on and and it's not it's not interacting in a way that's too busy. It's kind of like conversationally, like, you know, like it's very pieced yeah. together. And so when I hear that kind of thing, I always think like, oh yeah, clav, clav is where I'm going to go. Like, mm. that's the thing. And then as I listened to the tune, I was like, okay, then, then the changes came around and I'm like, okay, the second changes come in. I'm like, I can still play clav to this, but I, but whenever I hear changes, I'm like, oh yeah, I can, I can mess with chords here. And then I think like, all right, maybe I should go the Herbie route. And then at the end, I heard the clav sneak in. There was a clav part sneak in and I was like, oh, shit, okay, cool. It's already in there in a section. So then my, my debate came, how do I go full on like kind of Nick Simrod electronic weird thing? Or do I try and like mesh that with my like homage to Herbie Ville? And I... I tried some synth things and I, I felt, you know, again, just being a fan of this style of music and, and, you know, I was again, listening to Jameer choir from 16 on and like just being really into that kind of like acid jazzy thing. I as a jazzy thing. I was like, I've never really done that. So why don't I use this as my excuse? Like I don't need to be all modern and like synthy yeah. and glitchy no, and cool. stuff. I was like, I'm just going to be Herbie playing along to, or I'm going to try to be Herbie playing along to this kind of thing. So this breath deep breaths, <laughs> um, yeah. this is my, my playing along to it. So here we go. 
I made, I made it through it. <laughs> Wicked. Oh, you sound great over it. You sound great. You don't sound like Herbie. You sound like Nick. Oh, <laughs> man. It's, it's, it's always, thank you, man. It's, it's always so tricky w with something like that because you, you know, there was, I, I wanted to like make sure not to make it too busy. Um, but even, you know, even with lines, there's a few times hearing back to it where, you know, all the artisty stuff comes in is like, oh, I should have played less. But, I think that was, I think it worked out. <laughs> well, it's fantastic. And it's funny, even though you're playing that old school way, mm -hmm. it sounds modern. The way yeah. you voice things still sounds mm -hmm. modern. Yeah. You know, it really reminded me of those, some things I've been listening to that I like it at the moment. Not that it sounds like that. For some reason, mind sign and things like that. You he my, that. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. I like all that stuff that's coming out at the moment. And they're sort of starting to reference jazz, but in a different way, you know. Mm doing really interesting things with it um, i have to i have to give mind design props he's he's an la cat who i've hung with a few times and he to me and I, I know there's other people doing this but to me he's one of the people who's who's taking like the dx7 sound and kind of like bringing it back into the modern fold yeah because yeah. he it's like all his records are just yeah. that bell piano dx7 yamaha yeah. vibe but like just compressed like crazy and like gross and it's like awesome <laughs> and i love the way you you move with the force and things like that that was mm. real nice movements in oh so. thank you man yeah, yeah you know it's it's uh, i think that kind of thing you know i'm i'm so uh, i don't i don't know it's like i respect that kind of music to be that and and you know when when Yamaha originally approached us or approached I'm not sure exactly what they told you about it but they were like yeah we want to kind of get these different styles mixing or whatever mm -hmm. um, and so you know there were it was kind of hinted that I should be cognizant of like all right you know you do you over this thing or whatever um, yeah. and so I tried to give it my touch on that but it's like I feel like sometimes there's just certain types of music that just need to be what they are you know yeah. it's like. It's like that type of funk needs to just be that type of funk. And, you know, we can mold it into something new and kind of bring it into the future or whatever. But like, you know, if I'm listening to, let's say Ray Charles was still around, like if I'm listening to a Ray Charles record, I don't necessarily want to hear dubstep bass under it. No. You know, like it's like sometimes it's just so pure and it's in its state that like it's OK to keep it like that. And, and that skill set is another thing that I think you get through the experience of gigging is like, when, when does that work and when doesn't it? You know? totally. You're um, a sympathetic musician and that's the thing, isn't it? That is being musical to me. You yeah. know? Sometimes, like you say, it can be great to have a juxtaposition between two different styles, but mm -hmm. sometimes you have to judge that, yeah, the best thing for this is, you know, to be sympathetic it's just to it. The, the purity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, my my version of impurity was like, let me sneak in like two church chords. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, I'll just, I'll just. I'll yeah, you got them. some nice little movements there. I could hear in the we'll, D flat we'll, bit. Yeah, we'll, we'll 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 yeah. we'll tuck them in there a little bit. Yeah, lovely, yeah. Um, but dude, thank you for doing this. I mean, I guess one last question would be, well, actually, sorry, I wanted to bring up really quick. I totally forgot mm -hmm. about this. Um, in in another curious angle of how people kind of got their starts with things, 
How did you get lined up with Yamaha? Because I've, I think for as long as I've known you, you've been playing their stuff. But yeah, um, I've only I've known always, you for a few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've always used it. Um, I, even when I was a kid, my dad actually had a music shop and he was like Amazing. a Yamaha main dealer. So it's always been a bit of a thing to me. Killing, okay. Yeah, and I, and I always grew up with that thing of like the gear is just, I just, I, the, one of the reasons I love the Yamaha gear is it's so reliable. You know, you mm-hmm. just turn out, you never worry about if it's going to work or not. You know, it's just never lets you down. And I, and I also personally love the Yamaha piano actions. Mm, I think mm-hmm. you know, I like a heavier action. I think they, they're really positive. They feel more like a real piano action to me mm-hmm. you know, um, with the, the montage. Eight. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd always been using it. And then I think, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, um, Martin, the, uh, the guy who runs it in, in Europe, was mm-hmm. just contacted me, do, do I fancy doing a video? So I started getting more involved with them. Okay. Um, since then but I, I i love the gear i i really love the montage i mean i just think it's a, it's a fabulous synth in, not just mm. as a workstation but actually as a sound creation thing in yeah, itself yeah. You know, with the fm and it's just so flexible it's a beautiful synth yeah they they make great gear and they're also um you know my my experience with them on the road has kind of mm. kept kept them at a very high place for me you know it's like their their gear is great you know their approach is cool i've been doing some testing for them so i feel like i have a little bit of an investment in the company that way Um, but uh, you know i i do think nowadays it's kind of rare for a company to have loyalty to their artists (laughs) and and yamaha to me is is just like it's like wherever i need help i get it there for you they really do they stick with people yeah and it's really great i think they work with people that they genuinely like actually that i feel you know Mm -hmm. uh, because they're such a big company you know Mm -hmm. they yeah i feel that they've always really looked after me and you know i like i say i genuinely love the gear i'm not someone that will just get free stuff everywhere you know just for the sake of it it's just no point you know but i love their gear yeah yeah that's amazing well very last question would be what what would be your advice to younger people who who not not just musicians in general but people who I feel like are in a uniquely weird spot now of they're entering into a music business that is sort of to a certain extent in tatters um, you know touring is going to be really different recording now is is almost exclusively from home and and even sessions you know are kind of weird with the whole covid thing nowadays like what what is your advice to people kind of starting their career now that you think will keep them not only sane but but successful <laughs> yeah it's a big question i say um, that with I... a hint of cynicism if you can <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, the music business has always been difficult, but you're right. I think it's probably never been more difficult. Uh, mm-hmm. I think my policy is the same as it used to be, and that is be flexible. You know, mm-hmm. just be ready. Don't never be proud. You know, you, any type of work you can get. If you're not working, any work is good. So, you know, never turn down things if you're just sitting around. Mm-hmm. Take any opportunity. And, and then you just have to think outside the box now. Like, you know, I, my daughter, she's trying to do a bit of singing. She was telling me, you know, there's there's kids out there making beats and selling them for like $100 or something, and mm. you own all the rights, yeah. you know, which is obviously not a great deal for them. But it's like, if you're starting out, you, you, you're making $100, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can always find some way to work, I think, if you, if you have some quality. You know, obviously, the difficult thing is finding people, but... The main thing is don't just sit on your ass and wait for <laughs> the phone to ring because, you know, that, that's yeah. the main thing. Get out there, do stuff, be proactive. Mm-hmm. Try, just try, try a million different things. And sooner just or later, effort. Yes. I feel yeah. like that's the theme of our chat today is just give effort. <laughs> yeah, put more effort in than everyone else. I think yeah. it's the same, anything, music or anything, mm-hmm. you know, the, given that you've got some talent, obviously, sure. but, you know, if you have and you can play well and you know you can play well then it is just a matter of put yourself in as many situations as possible expose mm-hmm. yourself to as many people as possible and sooner or later something will 
something will happen for you, I reckon. I love that, and I totally agree. Matt Johnson, this has been great. I'm glad to uh, digitally Later. hang, digitally hang, and I hope that uh, someday soon we can get together again. <laughs> I hope so, mate. I'd love to see you in a festival somewhere with a dude. With a in my hands. <laughs> I, I hope, yeah, I hope it's Batumi, and I hope I have one of those giant like. I wish I could remember what it was called, but it's like a it's like a circle of bread with another <laughs> circle of cheese in the middle, and it's not a pizza. It's like ugh, I dream about it every day. It's crazy. Well, have yeah. Thank you for doing this, and uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Yamaha, for hosting all this. This has been the Behind the Synth Podcast.